Welcome to In the Zone with Anthony. It's been a minute and we are going to try to give you as much as we can with the time that we have to give you. What a crazy weekend it has been for college and pro football. NFL kicked off for sure in high gear this past Sunday after we had an appetizer on Thursday with the Baltimore Ravens and the Kansas City Chiefs. But what I want to do is I want to start off by giving you some news. Because if things couldn't get any worse for the Cleveland Browns, things could be a whole lot worse for one Deshaun Watson as he's back in hot water with legal system. Yep, just when you thought all of his problems were over with, besides his terrible play on the field. As a matter of fact, the Browns look so bad that some people refer to them as the Cleveland Clowns. Of course, we know the Clowns, the team that had that nickname back in the day, was actually part of the Negro League Baseball League. But, Let's dive into Deshaun Watson and his problems. Because I'm not sure this week could get much worse for Cleveland Browns quarterback Deshaun Watson. After playing abysmally in the humiliating loss to the Dallas Cowboys, Watson has now been named in another lawsuit. A new victim stemming from a date in 2020 while he was a member of the Houston Texans has accused Watson of sexual assault. Sparring the details of the accusations here, Pro Football Talk's Mike Florio outlines the newest lawsuit in his breaking article, and we will get to that later. His time in Cleveland has already looked like it is coming to an end, and based on the product the Browns have gotten on the field, now his exit may just be expedited as the legal process continues to unfold here and it may just warrant a suspension as Yahoo Sports' Charles Robinson believes the NFL will look at this lawsuit differently than the already resolved suspension from 2022. If Watson is indeed suspended, all of his guarantees will be voided on his contract and the Browns will be able to cut bait without penalty. So, let's just take a look at Pro Football Talk's Mike Florio as he outlines the newest lawsuit in his breaking article. We can pull that up right here and we do have that right here. As Deshaun Watson is sued for sexual assault and battered. As Browns quarterback Deshaun Watson struggles to regain his old form, he has a new legal issue. On Monday, Watson was sued in Houston for sexual assault and battery and intentional infliction of emotional distress. The accusations were strikingly similar to those made against Watson in more than 20 lawsuits filed in 2021. However, the plaintiff in the new case, who filed under the Jane Doe pseudonym, contends that she went on a date with Watson. Most, if not all, other cases arose from paid massages that Watson had arranged. The lawsuit explains that the date was set for October 10, 2020. Watson, per the lawsuit, was initially unable to find her apartment. He called her and allegedly began aggressively yelling and screaming and stating that he could not find her apartment and that he doesn't have time for this. You can probably translate what came after this. The lawsuit then contains the following. When Watson finally arrived at Doe's apartment, Doe had not finished putting on makeup, so she invited Watson in to have a seat in her living room while she finished getting ready. As she was putting on makeup in her bathroom, Doe left the bathroom door open and attempted a conversation with Watson, trying to ease the tension from his angry outburst. Jane Doe quickly began to believe she was talking to herself because Watson wasn't responding. Jane Doe came out of her bathroom to investigate Watson's silence and shockingly found him completely naked on her bed, lying face down on his stomach. 
While Jane Doe stood there in shock, Watson turned his head and aggressively insisted that she massage him, gesturing to his buttocks. Jane Doe asked if Watson meant he wanted her to massage his back, but Watson indicated that it was his buttocks he wanted massage. Jane Doe was at this point in the encounter terrified. She was in her small apartment with a much larger man, and she was still reeling from Watson's outburst and aggression on the phone. Doe thus tried to appease Watson by rubbing his back rather than his buttocks. Watson began insisting again that she focus on his glutes. Seemingly frustrated that Doe would only rub his back, Watson then turned over revealing an erection. Wow. Watson continued to demand that Jane Doe massage him, gesturing from his knees to his groin. Jane Doe froze in fear, unsure of how to refuse Watson's advance without jeopardizing her safety. Confused and scared, she reiterated to Watson that she wasn't a masseuse. Watson asked her what she wanted to do instead. Before Jane Doe could answer, Watson grabbed Jane Doe's legs and positioned her so that she was lying down. Watson then partially disrobed Jane Doe and penetrated her vagina without consent, implicit or explicit. Jane Doe felt paralyzed, unsure if she would risk her safety by trying to stop Watson or endure his assault. Watson roughly sexually assaulted Jane Doe for several minutes in a missionary position. Before grabbing her and flipping her over, Watson continued to assault Doe aggressively from behind. Jane Doe finally gathered the outrage and strength to escape Watson. Jane Doe quickly ran to her dresser to grab a heavy piece of decor for self-defense and yelled at Watson to get out of her apartment. Enraged, Watson stormed out of Jane Doe's apartment. The statute of limitations for most personal injury cases is two years. In Texas, a five-year window applies because the case expressly alleges sexual assault. The plaintiff is represented by Tony Busby. He represented many others who sued Watson in 2021. This new case arise, raises plenty of issues from the standpoint of the league and the Browns. It's possible that Watson could be subject to further scrutiny under the personal conduct policy. It's also possible that a suspension, if one is imposed, could give the Browns a path toward voiding his remaining salary guarantees and ending the relationship. The biggest difference between the latest case and the others is that Watson specifically is accused of sexual assault. So we will definitely keep an eye on that story as it unfolds. Speaking of other high-profile athletes, who had a little brush with the law. One Tyree Hill. What a day he had. He simply says, if I wasn't Tyree Hill, Lord knows it could have been worst case scenario. Tyree Hill wonders what might have happened during a traffic stop Sunday if he wasn't the Dolphins star wide receiver. Officers accused Hill of being uncooperative when they handcuffed and detained him near Hard Rock Stadium, putting him face down in the pavement. Hill, who received citations for careless driving and a seatbelt violation before being released, gave his version of events in his first interview about the incident. Hill told NBC that the police confrontation went from zero to 60 and believes things could have turned out far worse if he wasn't who he is. If I wasn't Tyree Kill, Lord knows, I probably would have been like worst case scenario. I would have been shot or would have been locked up and put behind bars, you know, for a simple speeding ticket, he'll say. And that's crazy that officers would take it, you know, to that level. The Miami-Dade Police Department put at least one officer on administrative duty while an internal affairs investigation is conducted. Footage has emerged of the confrontation between Hill and the officer. From the moment that those guys pulled up behind me, knocked on my window, it went from zero to 60 immediately, Hill said. Hill said he called team security officials from the car. That officer was really on a power trip, Hill said. He felt like he just needed to 
do something that day, you know. But like I said, I'm glad nobody was hurt. Hill celebrated his 80-yard touchdown Sunday by putting his hands behind his back, feigning being handcuffed as Jalen Waddle pretended to be the officer escorting him off. You got to learn how to laugh and have a good time, Hill said. Man, whenever people think you're having a bad situation or having a low moment, I always try to find the good in every situation. That's one way I'm able to stay so strong-minded as a young male. Well, as a as a young male, well, as a young black male. Hill's attorney released a statement Monday confirming Hill is considering litigation. So that would be another story that we will definitely keep our eyes on. Deshaun Watson and his legal issues that continue, as well as Tyreek Hill, who will probably be seeking litigation. So what I'm going to do here, I'm going to take a break. Because when I come back, I'm going to take a look at a couple of coaches who I feel whose seat might be a little bit on the warm side after the weekend. Who's that? Come back with me on the other side of this break and we will find out. Right here on In The Zone with Anthony. Welcome back to In The Zone with yours truly, Anthony Smith. It is a Monday after a college football weekend, and man, there are a lot of questions that need to be answered. So look at week two college football winners and losers, courtesy of Yahoo Sports. And the one takeaway is this right here. Michigan and Notre Dame have real work to do to make playoffs. Quite honestly, based on what I've seen, I really don't see neither one of them making the college football playoffs. I really don't. No. Uh, there are two guys who I'll say, I'll say right now, they may be nice guys. Matter of fact, I think Sharon Moore, he's a product of Derby, Kansas. He was in, shortly after he got the Michigan job, he was spotted in Derby, Kansas and people of Derby really gave him a round of applause and appreciated his presence nice guy Marcus Freeman also nice guy it, it, it seemed like the, the players would run through a brick wall for him it's one thing to run through a brick wall it's one thing to beat Northern Illinois something they didn't do so Michigan and Notre Dame are far from playoff ready especially on offense The two top 10 teams will tumble down the AP top 25 on Sunday after embarrassing losses. Number 10 Wolverines were manhandled by number 3 Texas in a 31-12 loss that wasn't as close as the final score indicated. And number 5 Notre Dame followed up its 10-point win at Texas A&M in week 1 with an embarrassing 16-14 loss to Northern Illinois. Fighting Irish entered the game as a 28 and a half point favorites. Both teams sit one and one largely because of their inability to pass the football effectively. Michigan didn't add a transfer after J.J. McCarthy's departure to the NFL and held a quarterback competition between Davis Warren and Alex Orgy. After adding a transfer QB and Sam Hartman a season ago, Notre Dame went transfer route again and signed Duke's Riley Leonard for 2024. In addition to Leonard, Notre Dame rehired former offensive coordinator Mike Denbrock from LSU, where he coordinated an offense that included Heisman winner Jaden Daniels and first-round picks Malik Neighbors and Brian Thomas in 2023. Neither Warren 
or G. or Leonard has been an effective passer so far this season. Warren was named Michigan's starter as Orgy has seen limited playing time for the second straight season. After throwing just 118 yards on 25 pass attempts against Fresno State, Warren wasn't much better against the Longhorns. He was 22 of 33 passing for 204 yards, but many of those yards came after Texas went up 31 to 6. A big reason for that deficit, Warren's two interceptions. Warren's story is phenomenal. The senior was diagnosed with leukemia in 2019 while he was in high school. He spent more than four months in the hospital getting treatments and is now starting games for the defending national champions. You cannot question his desire or perseverance, but you can question the performance of the Michigan offense over the past two weeks. The Wolverines have scored just three touchdowns and 36 offensive points over the first two games of the season. Yes, Michigan lost a lot from its offense a season ago. Given the off-season change in Ann Arbor, it was realistic to expect some early growing pains as offensive coordinator Sharon Moore took over as the team's head coach. It's hard to find offensive bright spots, however. Jim Harbaugh's offense was predicated on play-action pass plays off a dog run game. So far, Michigan has recorded 57 carries for 228 yards. Are teams loading up even more to stop the run knowing that McCarthy is now in the NFL? Warren averaged 4.7 yards a pass against Fresno State and only surpassed that mark against Texas after the Longhorns knew the game was out of reach. Leonard, meanwhile, has not displayed the traits that make some draft analysts believe he's a possible first-round pick in the 2025 NFL Draft. He's averaging just over five yards per pass attempt over the first two games of the season, and his second interception of the game on Saturday ended up being the pivotal moment. With Notre Dame facing a second and short up by one with less than six minutes to go, Leonard fired this pass across the middle into two high Safety look, and we're going to try to give you some audio on this. And you can definitely hear a smithering of boobs after that. And at that point, Irish was clinging to a one-point lead, 14-13. to 13. Northern Illinois then drove down the field and kicked the go-ahead field goal with 31 seconds to go. The expanded playoff isn't out of reach for either team. Alabama made the playoff a season ago after losing in Week 2. Notre Dame has a schedule that includes just two top 25 teams the rest of the season. As of Saturday, and Michigan will have opportunities for big wins against USC, Oregon, and Ohio State. But the margin for error for either team is pretty much zero. We're not counting out Notre Dame and Michigan from the postseason, but we're a lot more pessimistic than we were at the start of the season, unless the passing offense takes a huge step forward. So, who were some of the winners this past week? How about Syracuse quarterback Cal McCord. Wait a minute, are we are we talking Syracuse? Are we talking about the orange team? You know, Syracuse Orange. I mean, if you stop and think about it, when was the last time we were talking about Syracuse? Anyway, Syracuse quarterback Cal McCord. The Orange took down number twenty-three Georgia Tech, thirty-one twenty-eight on Saturday thanks to a strong performance by the former Ohio State QB, McCord. By the former Ohio State QB, McCord was 32 of 46 passing, 381 yards, and four touchdowns. McCord threw his first two TDs to Trevor Pena before hitting Rondo Gatson the second for two more scores. His TD throw to Gatson with 839 to go turned out to be the winning score as Syracuse ran out the clock after Tech cut the lead to three. 2.31 to go. 
Clemson QB Cade Klubnick. The Tigers bounced back from week one loss from their week one loss to Georgia with a vengeance. Klubnick was 24-26 passing for 378 yards and five touchdowns in a 66-20 route of Appalachian State. A downfield pass and attack that was non-existent against the Bulldogs exploded against the Mountaineers as Brian Wesco Jr. and Jake Brenningstool each had at least 100 yards receiving while Phil Maffa had 10 carries, 418 yards, including an 83-yard TD run. Clemson scored 35 points in the first half and had 56 by halftime. Army, the Black Knights, had no issue with the Florida Atlantic. Army won 24-7 as it ran 58 times for 405 yards. FAU was helpless to stop Army's rushing attack and also allowed 44, allowed a 44-yard TD pass on Bryson Daly's only completion of the day. The real highlight came from backup punter Matthew Rose. However, look at his wheels on this 23-yard fake punt TD. And we got some sound bite for that as well, too, so let's just cue it up. But the home players will tell you, we got to do it. It's a fake! The special teams... Some more hocus pocus scampering towards the end zone. Matthew Rhodes, the holder. How about that? 23 yards, and for the second week in a row, more trickery. Yep, that's right. Some more trickery from the Army Black Knights, so they're pulling out all the tricks. Tennessee, the number 14 volunteers, ran away from number 24 NC State. Tennessee won 51 to 10 and rushed for 249 yards against the Wolfpack. Tennessee QB Nico Lama Leva threw two interceptions, but Dylan Sampson rushed 20 times for 132 yards and two TDs as the Tennessee defense didn't let NC State's offense do much of anything. The Wolfpack had just 141 total yards and were miserable, a miserable 3 of 12 on third down. South Carolina, the Gamecocks were dominant on defense in a 31-6 drubbing of Kentucky in the first SEC game of the season. Kentucky quarterbacks Brock Vandegrift and Gavin Wimsat were just 6-17 for 44 yards and South Carolina recorded five sacks, forced two turnovers. It was a huge win for South Carolina and coach Shane Beamer as the team looks to bounce back from a disappointing 5-7 and seven season in 2023. Louisiana Monroe coach Bryant Vincent. The Warhawks got a huge 32-6 win over UAB. The loss drops UAB to 3-9 against FBS opponents in former NFL player Trent Dilfer's time as head coach. Dilfer was hired ahead of the 2023 season after Vincent spent 2022 as the team's interim coach when he was promoted following Bill Clark's retirement. Instead of keeping Vincent after a 7-6 season, UAB chose Dilfer. On Saturday, Vincent got a bit of revenge. Off the field. And here you go on the blitz. Oh Intercepted. Pick six. Carlin Biggers. Did he just put the nail in the coffin on the pick six on the Blazers? I think they're about to start warming up the buses. My goodness, what a dominant performance by this defense. That was a miscommunication between the quarterback, Zeno, and his wide receiver, Amari Thomas. He's out there thinking, uh, maybe it was an option route. He was running. And there you have that pick six. USC, do the Trojans have a defense? The Trojans shut out Utah State 48-0 late Saturday night and held the Aggies to just 190 yards of total offense. Granted, Utah State is facing some turmoil this year with the abrupt firing of coach Blake Anderson over the summer but a shutout is nothing to sneeze at, especially if you're Lincoln Riley. The game was the first time a team coached by Riley was shut out an FBS opponent. Oklahoma pitched two shutout in Riley's tenure in Norman, but both came against FCS teams. After holding LSU to 20 points in Week 1, the offseason hire of former UCLA defense coordinator Deanne Tom Lynn is paying immediate dividends. Now, for the losers, and I'll tell you what I'm going to do. 
I am going to take a break. And when I come back, we'll take a look at the losers from this past weekend. So don't you go nowhere. You're locked in the zone with yours truly, Anthony Smith, on a Monday evening. another segment of In the Zone with yours truly and Smith on a Monday. We'll take a look at what happened over the weekend in college football, looking at some of the winners and looking at losers. The first things we touched upon was the Deshaun Watson situation, his legal issues have resurfaced and reared his ugly head to the point to where there might be suspension and all that money that he signed for. As we'll get ready to kiss it goodbye. That depends on what the league and the Browns decide to do. And right about now, I'm pretty sure the Browns are ready to cut ties. At least the fans are. You know, there's one guy I'd like to really talk to about this. He's a black guy that's here locally. His name is Scott Styles. He's a big Cleveland Brown fan. I'm going to send him a text message and maybe get him on talk about this situation. I know he's in tune with the Browns. And I believe the general sentiment is Browns fans are ready to cut ties. I mean, we know that Deshaun finally got to play a full season. Well, got injured. They were saved by two backups, pretty much. Uh, they're probably calling for Joe Flacco right about now again. Wherever the store he might be bagging groceries or whatever couch he may be laying over, they might be looking, we need Joe Flacco back. I mean, it, it's, got, it's that bad. I mean, first game of the season, Maybe that's what the problem is. Maybe he knew there were some legal issues and mentally he's just not locked into the game. But I think Browns fans right now, they're ready to part ways and this might be their exit plan. Uh, then we looked at Tyreek Hill's situation. You know, before the game, is detained, arrested, cuffed, face down. Man, what's, what's going on out there in Florida? Then we look at the winners and losers. We looked at Notre Dame and Michigan. Uh, before I get into the losers, because I just got the general feeling. This is what, Marcus Freeman's second, third year Notre Dame. I know second year for sure. Uh, how hot is his seat? And just how fast is the stock rising for University of Northern Illinois head coach Thomas Hammett, who has his team off to a 2-0 and start, especially after their shocking upset to Notre Dame. I'm pretty sure his stock is rising. The question is, would he be willing to take a higher paying job at a power school or would he be content to continue to build his alma mater where he's coaching it now, which is Northern University of Northern Illinois where he was a running back back in his day. Based on his demeanor, he looked like he may be content. He looked like he may be happy. And I know when I say this, those of you who are here in the Wichita area that know me very well, y'all know we went through some things with Wichita State basketball and their coach Greg Marshall at the time. And when he was always getting poked, and big schools were after him, and he would always say, why mess with happy? And who knows? Thomas Hammett could be in that situation. He may be happy and don't want to mess with it. I mean, you always look, you know, to get a bigger, more attractive, more high-paying job. But at the same time, if he could build his program where he's at right now and make them a viable player, who's to say they don't run the table and get a sniff at the college football playoff? I think it would be well worth it for him to stay where he's at. If he can do that on a continual basis, pull off an upset on a yearly basis. 
because watching that game, I could tell you, his team looked unfazed playing in South Bend, Indiana. They looked like they were not rattled by the hostile environment. The sea of gold shirts, the golden helmets, they were unfazed. Is this a product of what the transfer portal has done for college football? I don't know what their NIO look like, but I can guarantee you it's not nothing near what the power schools can dish out. So just looking at the transfer portal alone, has it made college football to some extent a more even playing ground? Is it apparent that parity is beginning to surface throughout college football and that on any given Saturday, anybody, as University of Northern Illinois proved, can be beat. Which takes me to my next point. Let's take a look at the losers. Cincinnati. Things were looking good for the Bearcats during the third quarter of their game against Pitt. Since he had a 27-6 lead and looked to be on the way to an easy win. Instead, Pitt scored 22 unanswered points, including 15 in the fourth quarter to seal a 28-27 win. Pitt's game-winning points came with 17 seconds left on a 35-yard field goal by Ben Sauls as Cincinnati's final four possessions ended in three punts and last ditch fumble as time expired. Auburn. The Tigers' offense is far from a finished product in Hugh Freeze's second season. Cal went to Auburn and got a 21-14 win on Saturday after forcing five Auburn turnovers. Ouch. The Tigers fumbled once in QB. Peyton Thorne threw four interceptions. His final two picks came on Auburn's last two drives of the game after the Tigers cut the Cal lead to seven with 6.06 to go. With this schedule that includes Oklahoma, Georgia, Missouri, and Alabama, a win over Cal would have been a huge step for bowl eligibility. Instead, Auburn needs to get at least three wins in the SEC to make the postseason. Arkansas. You were so, so close, Razorbacks. Arkansas was up 21-7 on Oklahoma State in the final half before the Hogs were outscored 24-10 in the second half in a 39-31 OSU win in double overtime. OSU's first score came on a pick six, and Arkansas fumbled twice in the second half. Those turnovers led to 10 points by the Cowboys as they slowly crept back into the game. It's a bad loss for the Razorbacks, but there's still some reason for optimism. Oklahoma State is a Big 12 title contender, and Bobby Petrino's offense is working. Arkansas racked up 648 yards of total offense after scoring 10 TDs and 10 possessions in Week 1. SMU. The Mustangs were a potential sleeper pick in their first year in first year of ACC play. They're now 2-1 after an ugly 18-15 loss at home to BYU on Friday night and have a QB controversy brewing. Preston Stone started the game but was benched after throwing four passes for four yards. He was replaced by Kevin Jennings, and he wasn't much better. Jennings finished the game 15 of 32 for 140 yards and an interception. SMU has played two games against FBS opponents so far and does not look great in either of them. At least the Mustangs are off next week before playing TCU. Kent State. It's been a rough few years for the Golden Flashes. Kent State dropped to 1-13 in Kenny Burns' tenure with a 23-17 loss to FCS St. Francis PA on Saturday. Ooh. The Red Flash entered their Week 2 matchup off an 18-10 loss to Dayton in Week 1 and made a quarterback change to redshirt freshman Jeff Hohenstein. He completed 11 of his 22 passes for 195 yards, and St. Francis rushed for over 200 yards on the Kent State defense. So there you have the losers, and some of that did not look good at all. Well, I know this wasn't a long version, but 
you got a lot of information packed up in a little bit of time. One thing I do want to look at before we get out of here. Anyone who witnessed the game between the Packers and the Eagles know that there was an injury that took place. But how about this story right here? Green Bay Packers have been without their starting quarterback before, but not too often. Here is how it went. This is how we're going to close out. Brett Favre famously started an unprecedented 297 NFL games in a row. And though Aaron Rodgers has experienced major injury, Sunday could mark the first time in the Matt LaFleur era that a backup quarterback starts for the Green Bay Packers. It doesn't happen often that the Packers find themselves without their number one option under center. But with Jordan Love sustaining a knee injury in the final moments of Green Bay's season, opener against Philadelphia, LaFleur said Monday that the team will turn to Malik Willis with Sean Clifford as well as his backup if Love is unable to play against the Indianapolis Colts. When the Packers have encountered this situation before, the results haven't always been terrible, but it's naturally a bit of a mixed bag. Here are the moments the Packers have been forced to turn to plan B at quarterback in recent history and how it went. 2017 season, Brett Hundley. Packers without Aaron Rodgers, 3-6. and six. The Packers were out to a 4-1 start when disaster struck in the sixth game at Minnesota when Rodgers was tackled by Minnesota's Anthony Barr and fractured his collarbone. Brett Hundley finished that game and threw three interceptions while taking four sacks. It was the first of three straight losses and five out of six with Hundley under center. Packers, however, barely scraped by two last-placed opponents for back-to-back wins in December, a 26-20 overtime win over Tampa Bay and a 27-21 overtime win over Cleveland, a team that ultimately finished the year winless. Huntley completed a 25-yard pass to Devontae Adams for the clinching score in the latter game. Could the Packers potentially pull off a miracle run like they did in 2013 without Rodgers? With Green Bay still alive for a playoff spot, Rodgers was able to return in Week 15, having missed seven full games and most of eight. But he wasn't 100% when Green Bay lost to Carolina 31-24 and found itself eliminated from postseason contention. Rodgers returned to the sideline for the final two weeks of the season, both losses. Huntley, a fifth-round draft pick in 2015, never found his footing in the NFL. He last appeared in three games for Arizona in 2019. 2013 season, Seneca Wallace, Scott Tozin, Matt Flynn, Packers without Rodgers, 2-4-1. Is it a stretch to call the 2013 season a miracle? It was November 4, 2013, when Rodgers was taken to the turf by Chicago Bears defensive end Shea McClellan, suffering a collarbone fracture that would wind up costing him most of that game and all of seven more. For the first time in a generation, Packers fans were about to see their team playing an extended period without their starter. First up to take his place was veteran backup Seneca Wallace. But after he finished the Bears game in Week 9, he was lost for the year early in the Week 10 game against Philadelphia with a groin injury. That brought former Badgers quarterback Scott Tozen to the fore. Although the Packers also signed an old friend and former Rodgers backup, Matt Flynn, once Wallace went out. Tolson started the next two games but wasn't effective, and Green Bay then gave Flynn a shot. A 40-10 blowout loss in Detroit proved an ominous first game. But when the Packers won absolute stunners over Atlanta, 22-21, and Dallas, 37-36, rallying from a 26-3 halftime deficit on the road, in the latter contest with Flynn throwing three touchdowns in the second half and Eddie Lacy finishing with 141 yards rushing. That kept Green Bay's precarious hopes alive to win the NFC North without a dominant challenger seizing the reins. After an insequential loss to Pittsburgh on December 22nd, Green Bay went to Soldier Field for a winner take all North battle against the Bears. Rodgers returned, as did Randall Cobb after missing 10 games of his own with injury. They connected on a a memorable 48-yard touchdown with 38 seconds left that vaulted the Packers to a 
33-28 win and somehow a division title with an 8-71 record while the Bears finished 8-8. Eight and eight. Green Bay fell to San Francisco in the first round of the playoffs with Rodgers under center, but even getting to that point was nearly incomprehensible. Single game moments to remember. November 7, 2021 at Kansas City, Jordan Love. Before Jordan Love became a full-time starter, he was a second-year understudy who got pressed into action against the host Kansas City Chiefs. Aaron Rodgers had tested positive for COVID-19 and the rev- revelation that he would miss the game turned into a de facto announcement that he was not vaccinated according to league standards. Running contrary to what he had previously told reporters. As that scandal raged on, Love attempted to make his first NFL start. It wasn't an utter disaster on paper in a 13-7 loss, and Love threw his first career touchdown. He also, however, threw his first interception, completed 19 or 34 passes for 190 yards, and clocked in with a quarterback rating of 69.5. Also, his mom and then-girlfriend were famously relegated to the back row of Arrowhead Stadium in Kansas City. The Chiefs went on to finish went on to finish 12 and 5 and reached the AFC Championship game. Rodgers returned the following week for the Packers who finished 13 and 4 but lost to San Francisco in the divisional round. And I'm going to give you one last memorable moment before we go ahead and check on out here. January 1 January 1, 2012, versus Detroit, Matt Flynn. This absence was by design, with the Packers having clinched home field advantage with a dazzling 14-1 performance in a follow-up to the 2010 Super Bowl victory. Rodgers was tested, was rested for the season finale against Detroit. Flynn, in his first go-around with the Packers before signing a lucrative off-season deal in Seattle, one that never got off the ground because of a draft pick named Russell Wilson, was spectacular. He threw for a franchise record six touchdown passes since matched by Rodgers and 480 yards in a thrilling 45-41 win. Detroit's mad youth effort threw for 520 yards and five touchdowns of his own. But Sam Shields intercepted Stafford with 33 seconds to go at the Green Bay 20-yard line. It was a fantastic grace note on a 15-1 season, although the season had an unhappy ending with a division round exit against the New York Giants. So there you have some moments when the Packers didn't have their starting quarterback and what life was like without their starting quarterback. It remains to be seen what happens if Jordan Love is unable to go next week. Well, that is going to do it for me here on a Monday evening. Hope you enjoyed today's of In the Zone with Anthony. There will be more of these to come as we are into the college and pro football season. As a matter of fact, hopefully I'll be back on tomorrow to give you some scores and highlights from the NFL as we wrap up week one with Monday Night Football. We'll have all that and some more for you on tomorrow's In the Zone with Anthony. Also, be on look, listen for the A-Train Sports Talk podcast, which is my other one as I will be giving you the recap of what happened over the weekend with high school football. Also, KCAC football as well too, the small college schools here in Kansas. So I'm going to have that all on the A-Train as well too. So we have two podcasts coming out. So you'll want to stay tuned to both of them. Until next time, take care of yourself, each other, and each other. I'm out of here.